Hello there. Welcome to the Happy Even After podcast. I am here today with Hillary Billings. Hillary is an on-camera red carpet host, celebrity interviewer, and former Miss Nevada. She has been featured uh, on in USA Today, Elle, Huffington Post, Extra, and Entertainment Television, and the list goes on and on. She has shared the stage with the likes of William Shatner and Bon Jovi. But her story is so much more than glitz and glam. She's also a burn survivor, a graduate school reject, and a recovering perfectionist, and that's where her mission and passion comes from. So welcome, Hillary. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me, Renee. So I want to talk first about your journey to Miss Nevada, because something kind of traumatic happened in order to get there. Can you share your story? Yeah, I had no intentions of ever becoming a beauty queen. And I think like a lot of women, I had my own uh, stereotypical thoughts and preconceived notions as to what that looked like. And it wasn't until the summer prior uh, to when I actually competed that I had a, a life event happen. So at the time I was a travel blogger. I was living around the world, traveling nomadically. I had just gotten back from this incredible experience. It was an invite only to live with the Firewalkers in Fiji. I spent a month out there with them and just learning their culture and having these incredible experiences. And around this time, my blog was just starting to take off. I had gone from being rejected from graduate school to on this very unique path uh, post-graduation. And I was coming back from this trip and just really just kind of going through and letting the experience just saturate into my life. It was around the 4th of July. I went to a friend's 4th of July party and I didn't really want to go or be there. I was still so in my head and processing everything that had happened on the island. And when I went, it just became this unique series of events that led to a firework, uh, one that had been purchased illegally from one of the Indian reservations off town, which is very common in Las Vegas because they have the best mm -hmm. fireworks. And uh, they lit the fuse at the party to start the fireworks for the evening. The fuse went up and nothing happened. And everybody got really quiet because we knew that something was wrong. And that's when the firework exploded in the wrong direction. The fuse, which was on fire, traveled 30 feet through the air, circled around, and it was so purposeful. It just like, it was like, aha, I choose you. And it, oh, it came no. directly at my face, hit my sunglasses and went down my shirt. Oh. And I ended up suffering second and third degree burns to my chest and my stomach. And it was one of those things of, even getting to this party, I, I feel it's important to mention, I couldn't find the right clothes. And as a female, it's like, you know, roughly what you want to wear to an event. And I was so frustrated because the only bra I could find was the super padded Victoria's Secret bra. And it's like, I don't want to wear this, but I made the decision to put it on. And it ended up saving my life because the, wow. the firework and the fire just ate through the entire thing. And it would have been so much worse had I not had this armor on around me. Uh, but that's, that was this big ordeal. Uh, the chest is the slowest healing part of the body. We went and saw numerous doctors after uh, this event and you know, they didn't know what my healing time would look like. They didn't know if I would look normal. It was just so hard to say. Uh, so I spent the next six months hiding out mm -hmm. and posting blogs about previous travels, feeling like an imposter, feeling not comfortable mm -hmm. in my skin. And, you know, specifically as a woman, you know, having anything happen to those feminine parts of you, I just felt like Frankenstein. And having had a, a career in, in some modeling, Anytime I was, you know, called about a gig and I had to turn it down, I just felt so, uh, so horrible about myself. And I, w I finally decided to pick up a gig six months later for New Year's and I put on the dress and it was like this James Bond event and I was feeling so good about myself and I turned around in the mirror and I saw my scars and I just melted down and then we put on makeup and we covered it up and we did the thing and it was fine, but that was the moment of, I can't live in this pity party anymore mm -hmm. and I can't hide anymore. And up until that point in my life, I have always found that the way that I build my confidence is by just throwing myself into a situation that I don't think I can handle and then proving to myself that I can survive it. <laughs> and just by the act of, okay, I lived through that. Now I know that I can do that. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, that's always kind of been a, a reactionary way of getting myself to the next step. So 
I thought about what, what do I need to do here to get over my self-confidence issues about my body? And nothing sounded more terrifying than being on stage in a bikini and having <laughs> someone judge me based upon my appearance. So it's like, okay, we're doing a pageant. Here's what we've never wow. done one before, had no experience. I, I had no budget for this. Um, and I'm so lucky. I had just happened to meet, you know, six months prior, some beauty queens, and they were already changing my mind about what it meant to be a title holder. And then just going through the process, I mean, I, I hated every minute of preparation. I did not enjoy it. I've never been a girly girl. And I, I had nightmares and like night sweats every night leading up to the pageant about me being naked or tripping over something on stage and, you know, tripping over my heels. And, uh, but the whole experience, and it's so funny how we build something up in our minds. Cause I was mm -hmm. in a bikini for 30 seconds, like the rest of the pageant, there was so much, so much more impactful moments, uh, that I still remember. I don't even remember being on stage in a bikini at this point, uh, but that's, that's why I entered. And it was sincerely for that personal growth. And then I was very surprised when I won, <laughs> uh, you know, and had doing it on a shoestring budget, borrowing bikinis, getting my dress sponsored, you know, it's uh, the, the whole ordeal to me. Now looking back on it, it, it just was very kismet that it happened the way that it did. And uh, it provided me a platform to be able to work with the Byrne Foundation and, and Southern Nevada Firefighters Foundation, go out to the Byrne Institute and camp beyond the scars in California and, and speak as to other Byrne survivors who have had it so much worse than I have uh, and inspire them and be inspired by them and continuing this message forward of you don't have to be flawless to feel beautiful. So uh, yeah. So at the time, it was literally a reactionary thought of, I need to do this for my own personal self-growth. And it turned into a year of service that I couldn't have asked for a better platform and opportunity, which has since carried forward me in my career. So you get burned, you go on stage and you have someone judge you. And that is my <laughs> advice to all people. <laughs> Maybe without the burn part. But. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we all have metaphorical burns, right. right? One way or another. It's like, what's the thing that you need to do to put yourself in that situation to get yourself past that mental block and recognize that it's, it's going to be okay and whatever. And frankly, in my life, and I'm sure for many others, when you do that, you know, the universe tends to reward mm -hmm. that kind of behavior and that faith. Uh, and that's just what I've continued to learn as I trudge forward. Day Did day. you ever have a moment when you were about to walk on stage and you're like, no, no, I'm not going. Like you can't make me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, yes, there was, I think I had that thought every moment, but then you get to the point of like, you're, you're so invested, you've prepared mm -hmm. so much and it's like, all right, well, let's, let's just do this thing and, and make it happen. And then after those 30 seconds, it's like, oh, what was I so worried about? I mean, the mental game to me has always been so much harder than the physical action of doing mm -hmm. something. Right. And, uh, and it was interesting too, just getting over whenever you do something that you've got resistance to, to begin with, allowing all of the influences of these other women who had very strong reasons for being there as well. One of them, his brother had been homeless and she was an advocate for teen homelessness. Mm -hmm. Another, you know, was a recovering drug addict and wanted to talk about, you know, teens overcoming drug addiction. And everybody had a reason as to why they wanted to use this platform. And it was so powerful to see that. Uh, and even just shifting my perspective of, huh, the way I look at the world isn't actually the truth behind the world. And just starting to get into that perspective of however I look at something may not be the whole truth to a situation was a major, major life shift for me. Yeah. And so you actually have dedicated so much of your work to that confidence in the feeling of inadequacy that so many people have. Can you speak a little bit to the inadequacy part of it and what that looks like and how do we get rid of it? Yeah. I, I mean, for me, this is, it's been my lifelong battle. I still deal with it today. I, I don't come at it from a place of knowing everything, but I, I certainly am a curator of, of that information and knowledge and know that I, and the experiences that I've been through from going from the number one graduate of my university mm -hmm. to, you know, the proud owner of 14 rejection letters from PhD programs to becoming a burn survivor to Miss Nevada to then becoming an international journalist for, for major outlets to, you know, working as a, an on-camera host. What I found, and it was the, the on-camera host work that really set me forward and, huh, this isn't just me. When I started interviewing other celebrities and, you know, I've talked with the likes of Ringo Starr and Dolly Parton and Mark Cuban and 
these big names. And at first I was terrified to go right. and talk to them because I had no background in on-camera hosting. At the time, USA Today had just brought me on for a trial. Uh, they had seen me compete. They had seen some local blogging awards that I'd won and they wanted to see if I was a good fit. Uh, and it just so happened that the iHeartRadio Music Festival was coming up and they asked if I'd be willing to give it a shot. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And then I'm and like breathing into the paper bag after the phone right. call, trying to figure out what to do. And my first interview was Ryan Seacrest. So no pressure, you know, he's just the host of all hosts. But as I continued to interview more people, it became very clear that everyone's dealing with some form of inadequacy. Everyone's got some, something that's, you know, hitting their confidence. And as I started delving into more of the ramifications of that, you know, that keeps us from going after the relationships we want, feeling worthy, keeping us in situations that we don't want to be in, jobs that we don't want to be in, especially as women, it keeps us from asking for the promotions and the raises mm -hmm. that we deserve. We are, you know, most likely to make half, if not a quarter of what our male counterparts make just because we don't ask for what we think that we deserve. Uh, you know, it's staggering the, the research that's out there to support that actually having confidence is more important than being qualified. And in sales, it'll actually matter more if you feel confident about what you're saying versus you actually knowing the information. People were more apt to buy from you just on that alone. And when you think about how that impacts our daily interactions, uh, how we think and talk about ourselves, and then what that then looks like for the health of our, our minds and our bodies and our relationships, it's just a ripple effect that continues to go out. So. As I'm looking at you know, the problems in the world, to me, inadequacy is such a big one, especially in America, where I feel like we're constantly bombarded with external resources, social media, Instagram accounts, you know, advertisements, commercials, uh, magazines, articles telling us that we need to be something else than what we are. So yeah, my, my passion comes from helping, especially women, overcome these feelings of inadequacy to feel empowered and authentically build confidence and connection. Because I also think that there's so many people out there that make this push for like, you know, just fake it till you make it and this fake confidence. And I hate that because that's right. not helping to forward the dialogue or the interconnection between you and I. And that's not something that we can sustain. So I'm on a mission to help women figure out a way to authentically feel good uh, and do so in a way that helps them build more impact and live the lives that they actually want to live. And it, you, you raise such a good point because if you look at like, that's an ongoing problem that women have with confidence and we're always apologizing. Like before we even mm -hmm. say something, we apologize and you see men have all the confidence in the world and sometimes it's not founded and you know, it, it, it's just that they don't care. We need to have a little bit more of that too. So you, Absolutely. you've worked with moms and you've worked with entrepreneurs and you've worked with fashion models. What, what, what kind of conversation are you having with all of these people and how to deal with all of that? It's pretty much the same conversation. If we're gonna, I mean, it's the same thing. What, what do I, what do I need to do differently? You know, this is the thing that I'm struggling with. I don't feel confident here. Uh, you know, how do I? Uh, how do I position this? Or I have to go in for this interview or I don't, I don't know what the value add is here. Um, and it's really coming down to helping people control the narrative is, is what it is. Right. So when we're, and I, I refer back to my own experience when I was interviewing for Miss Nevada, where there were so many reasons that I shouldn't have won. Uh, and in my mind, there were many reasons why I shouldn't have won, including I'd never been in a pageant before. Uh, I had no previous pageantry experience. I, uh, I was a burn survivor, so I, I was physically flawed. Um, I was the whitest person and I was not naturally tan. Um, and, and all of these things I thought worked against me, but then you know, as I'm doing interview prep and I'm thinking about it, I real and even just the I was using the term burn victim and during one of my interview sessions my mock interview sessions uh, my coach was like no you're not a victim you're a survivor and just by switching those words you can show in your narrative that you have the power and that this is not something that affects you but you're allowed to use it for impact for others and that was a big moment for me to say mm -hmm. oh you're right let me just flip the script and be able to use this for my advantage. So then it became, yes, I'm a burn survivor, and yes, I'm, I'm physically flawed, and I wanna use this title to show people that you don't have to be perfect in order to make an impact or be an ambassador for your state. Uh, yes, I've never 
had a pageant experience before, which means that my entire audience, all of my friends have also have never experienced this, which means that I can introduce new blood and new perspectives into pageantry. Yes, I have a journalism background. I'm a unique uh, pageant contestant in that I am very, I, I love education. I consider myself an erudite. And this also shows that you can utilize the title for your own career advances and your own branding purposes outside of just the, the Miss Nevada organization. And it was interesting because the following year, we had double the number of entries. We had such a diverse group of women, including lawyers and business owners and publicists mm -hmm. and you know fitness coaches. And I was so proud of that, that these women had seen my year and recognized that they, were, they could leverage this title for more than just you know, parades and photo shoots, but actually right. to advance their community experience and impact and their careers. And that has since become you know, a legacy that we've continued on with all of the women that have won titles after me. Um, and I'm really proud of that fact. So going back to, it's a perspective shift of, uh, you know, how do we get you away from these negative emotions that are ruining your life and ruining your experience mm -hmm. and, and keeping you from making the impact, bringing it back to what's really going on and then moving from there to, okay, how do we move forward into the narrative? So, uh, so much is, is moving the perspective and that all starts with the shift from getting away from this exaggerated negative to a neutral middle. Like we have to make that bridge first. Right. And so what does that look like if someone, so a lot of uh, the listeners of this podcast are going through a divorce and there's so much uncertainty and overwhelm with that. And maybe they're coming out of a relationship feeling unworthy. How, how do they speak mm -hmm. to themselves to this new future that lies ahead of them that they don't know what that looks like? Yeah. And to me, when I think about what confidence really is, it's being able to have certainty in the face of uncertainty. Like you don't need to control everything. You don't need to know what's going to happen, but you, you do know in your heart of hearts and within your soul that you can handle whatever comes your way. And to me, that's, that's what I want to cultivate in everybody is the ability to say, I, I have no idea what my future looks like now, but I have me. And I know that I can rely on me to get me through this and I've got my back. And that's all you really need to know to keep moving forward. But to do that, oftentimes when we, we go through major traumatic life experiences, we attach a meaning to that, right? So oftentimes, you know, I, my sister went through a divorce and, and at the beginning, you know, she came from a very religious background. It was, have I failed, you know, and, and mm -hmm. if I failed the church and, uh, or concern of, of, disappointing parents. Uh, right. There's a lot of different things that we attach to a letting go of a season of our life. And it's like, what's really happening? If we're looking at just the facts, it's that you had a coupling that is now uncoupling. Like mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're taking all the emotion out of it, this was working for you at some point in your life. And now it's not. Right. Any breakup, whether it's, you know, in a personal intimate relationship or a friendship or a work relationship, at some point, it's, it's not about right or wrong. It's about, is this serving me? Is this not serving me? And so mm -hmm. shifting the conversation from this means that, you know, if we're looking at, I have this whole assumption analysis paradigm and, and framework of, okay, what's the facts? And normally when we look at the facts, we attach meanings to it that are very negative, right? And that's our decision. But the fact is simply, we went from being married to now we're not married. That is the fact. And you get to decide now what is the meaning? You can choose to say, this is, it's a terrible thing. I failed. Uh, this means that nobody will love me moving forward. This means that I, you know, was not worth loving. Um, this person was out to get me. This means that my family's going to be like, that's your decision to make that meaning. Mm -hmm. You could also make a positive meaning, which is, this means that now I, I know myself better. I can move forward. I have opportunities. I'm in a, you know, I know what my worth is. I know my value. I know more what I'm looking for. And that's great, but it's really difficult to go from being in that negative meaning attachment to jumping to that positive. So my encouragement is what's the neutral? Neutral is it doesn't have to say anything about me. This doesn't have to mean anything and just start there. And what, that, what happens then is on the, on the far end, when we look at how that affects your future, when you pick the negative meanings, you immediately limit what your future op options are based upon the fact that you've given such a negative connotation to this event. When you attach a positive, you provide a lot of different opportunities. But when it's neutral, you're independent. You have no, uh, one way or another, there's no attachment, which is actually a very free place to be. So my encouragement is always, okay, 
this major life thing has happened. What is the actual thing that happened? That is the only thing you need to focus on. Let's give it a neutral meaning. If you can't pick a positive one, it doesn't have to mean anything except it's not working anymore. And that just means now you have the freedom to choose whatever future you want. So that's my you know, short truncated advice, you know, as much as we can wrap up into a single podcast of it doesn't have to mean anything that you don't want it to mean. And you're actively making those choices. And just know that every time that you make a choice about a meaning, that's going to impact your future. And it doesn't have to be as big of a deal. And your meanings are going to be different than your mom's meanings, which are going to be different than your best friend's meanings. And that's okay. They can have their meanings. That doesn't need to impact you. Right, right. And so much of ourselves get hung up though on what our friends say and our family thinks and especially with something like a divorce and you know if you have the shame and the guilt and all of that that goes along with it but i love what you said because often people can't turn their or even have a positive thought about their soon to be ex-spouse so just bringing it neutral i mean that that makes so much sense so they don't have to make that big shift they don't they don't have to you know give their ex accolades but they can just from bring it to the neutral position until they're ready to move on. Oh, it is, uh, frankly, it is something that has long pissed me off about social media. It's just like, oh, feeling bad about your life? Just be grateful. And mm. it's like, yeah, thanks. I don't feel like anything right now. And now I want to shoot you because you like had the uh, audacity to tell me to feel good right now. Uh, you know, we, to make that jump, is is so difficult and even if you are able to you know fake it till you make it and when you think about inadequacy on one side and that confidence or that freedom on the other like that's a huge leap and to have someone make that jump and make it which is great but they're not going to stay there long they can't because their their temperature setting is all the way over here and so they're going to fall off they're going to feel like an imposter they're going to feel like you know maybe they don't deserve it because they can't sustain that emotion or maybe they're not meant to feel that way right. because they can't sustain that emotion and that just further isolates them and pushes them back into the feelings of inadequacy so for me it's all the whole concept of let's build a bridge we have to get to that middle point and we have to learn how to bring ourselves from the exaggerated negative to middle before we can successfully learn how to go from there to positive positive. And to me, that's been the biggest missing step when it comes to personal development, when it comes to going from inadequacy to confidence. And I'm excited to be able to share that message with the world. And you talk about toxic positivity, which just mm -hmm. seems so, so counterintuitive. What does that mean? Yeah. So toxic positivity is this notion of needing to live and that everything's great or we always need to find the positive. It's very much related to this. Well, you should just be grateful. Um, and I, the best example that I have of this is we, uh, I'm from Las Vegas. We recently moved back here, but I was living in Nashville for the past four years. And back in March, we had a, a category four F4 tornado come through. It was the second most deadliest tornado in Nashville's history, and it came within two blocks of our home. Um, and it was terrifying, middle of the night, to wake up, you know, get into the closets, just seeing what's happening and the destruction, not knowing where it's going. We, we lived without power for two weeks. Um, and the next night, it was so it's such a dichotomy and juxtaposition because half the city was fine and hadn't been touched at all by the tornado and still had power and was going about their regular lives. And then there was this other half of the city that was just mass destruction and heartache. And we went went the next night to a restaurant that we loved in Green Hills that hadn't been touched for a sense of normalcy. And I was so shocked by people just living their lives and chatting and having conversations. And two, I had two conversations that night and one was with uh, the front desk hostess, which we'll get to in a minute. And the other was with our waitress. And so she comes over and I'm emotional. And you know, even just being in that environment made me emotional because it's like, how can they can just be continuing on right now? It was so traumatic. Mm -hmm. And this girl's response was like, oh yeah, I slept through that. Well, it's a good thing you didn't like lose your home or anything, right? Like you should be really grateful for that. And I wanted to throw a fork at her. And it's like <laughs> what she was saying was that you should be grateful for this as in your emotions and how you feel about it don't count right now because it's not so bad. Other people have it worse. And I think especially in divorce, this is a common narrative. And I think people mean well by it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're trying to help you find the light. They're trying to make you feel better. But again, all it does is push you further away from them because it says to me, you don't understand my pain. You didn't go through this. You don't know what I'm feeling. And now I can't relate with you. And now I can't open up to you because you're telling me that my emotions don't count or I shouldn't feel this way. And like, don't shit on me. That's not okay. So 
that is toxic positivity is trying to tell somebody how to feel or that they shouldn't feel as bad as they feel about something, uh, especially when they haven't gone through that situation. And it's such a knee jerk reaction in our society because right. people don't know how to deal with uncomfortable emotions. They don't know how to be there. Right. So in contrast, we've got this hostess and I go up to her in the middle of our dinner and I'm like, Hey, uh, we lived in the path of the tornado. We haven't had power. Can I charge my phone somewhere? And she takes my phone and she gives me a hug and she's like, I am so sorry. Are you okay? What can we do? Do you guys need additional food to take home? You know, what else can it, does your, your husband need a phone charge? And, and I just started crying and she's holding, we're in the middle of a restaurant. And it was just this empathetic stance of, this must be so hard and I'm not living through this, but what can I do to serve you right now? And, and her finding ways to empathetically show up for me as a stranger with no connection to me whatsoever, but recognizing that this was a hard thing that I was going through and I didn't know how to ask for what I needed. And then she, going you know, 10X beyond that, it was so powerful to have somebody be so empathetically there for me. And, you know, I, in my past and in my, my younger days have been the person that has put on the talks of positivity or told my friends to buck up or, you know, just right. go forth and do an action. And what I'm learning now as I, I'm wizened in my old age is that <laughs> people don't need you to solve their problems. They need you to be present and just express that empathy and, and create space for them to feel how they feel. And, you know, grief and trauma, you know, yeah. they're processed differently by everybody. And that's not going to show up the same way. And I think in our society, we have such a, uh, a notion of, well, we have to move forward. We have to keep going. And, you know, this is inconvenient for you to right. be expressing your emotions. And the more that we try to stuff that down, that's where we get disease, that's where we get sickness and mental health issues. And we start feeling more disconnected from each other. And this is where we get the crazy rants on Facebook from somebody who just breaks. Uh, and we don't want to do that. So my advice to somebody is, is stay away as much as possible from trying to tell somebody how they should feel or what they should be grateful for, or where they should be focusing on. And instead, just say, wow, I, this must be really hard for you. And I'm here. And I love you. And you don't even need, I also think the whole concept of you know, let me know if you need anything is such a, an empty, mm. uh, negative way of trying to be helpful. It's, it's super ineffective and uh, it's a very inactionable and lazy way of offering to not look like a bad person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think for some people, they don't know what else to say, but it's like, either you just be there and say, I love you and I'm here for you and whatever you need to do and go through is okay. And, or you get to be the one that's uh, taking this opportunity to take action, whether that's bringing them food, giving them a charger, offering to watch the kids, right. you know, giving them, hey, I, I saw this job application or I saw this listing for an apartment. I know you're going through a divorce right now. I thought you might want to look at this. Or I found this article. I thought you might want to read it. I thought it might be helpful for you. I saw the show that I think is really funny. You know, taking those action steps to show that you're thinking about them in ways that they need that support right now. Because when you're going through that trauma, Right. To be able to vocalize what you need is such an elevated emotional intelligence response that most people don't know how to do that at that time. It, it, it reminds me of a friend of mine who had a child um, that was very sick and it was terminal and people would, didn't know what to say to her because it was such an uncomfortable conversation. So such, she had either two responses, one avoidance, you just don't say mm -hmm. anything and she was suffering and she didn't want to ignore it or the other one was offer some advice that she didn't want and so her response was always like please just say that you see me that you hear me and you're just going to sit kind of in that that ickiness and the muck with me and i don't need you to fix it mm -hmm. and you know don't ask me what i need just drop the casserole off you know and it yes. sounds yeah yeah, it's, you know, and it's so apropos for what we're going through right now in mm -hmm. our society. And, and there's so much unrest and there's so much anger and there's so much frustration and hate. And, and there is, there's a lack of empathy and there's a lack of desire to understand. And there's a lot of, of traumatic and, and hard right. feelings. And this is the time where we get to get uncomfortable together and hold space. Uh, if nothing else, just holding the space for, right. for those that are, are struggling. And again, I see you and, and having the conversations that I've had in the past couple of weeks, that's 
all people want. Mm. And in general, I think that's what all people want is to be seen and to feel loved and supported. And when we provide that for them, it's amazing what people can do and how they can grow. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's harder when you've, you've got family members that maybe don't understand that or come from a different generation with a different level of communication. And that's where we get to put up these loving boundaries of, you know, mom, dad, I love you very much. Just know that, you know, if this is going to be the conversation, I can't be around it. But, you know, if you just want to be present, you know, I, I need you to be present for me and love me through this. Uh, and that's a hard conversation to have. Yeah. But it's, it's so necessary for you to move forward without judgment and uh, to be able to live the life that you really need to live. Right. And it's, it's so interesting that as adults, those are hard conversations that we have. You know, and, and no matter how old you are, when you're an adult, it's like, oh, I have to go back and talk to my parents and have that hard conversation. You want approval. And it, I think sometimes it's just saying, okay, I don't need the approval, you know, and recognizing that in yourself that you don't need it. Absolutely. There's a difference between wanting it and needing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a nice to have, but it's not a requirement. And I right. think that that's how we need to look at life. It's like, there's a lot of things that would be nice to have. It'd be nice to have people not, you know, berate me on the internet for these silly videos that I do, but you know, it doesn't, it's not going to keep me from moving forward. And, you know, as you continue to show them that this path is the one that you're moving down, there's always going to be someone in lurking in the corners, ready to disapprove of your life and your decisions or your existence, just because they don't want to focus on their own. Right. And when we, when we stop looking, and also this, this idea of, not all opinions need to be weighted equally. So, you know, yeah, it might matter a lot to you what your parents think and absolutely tell them that, hey, you know, it matters to me that you support this. I don't need you to, but I really would like you to. Right. But you don't need the approval from Sally, whatever, down the street and your neighbors or the people at church. Like there, there's a, a decline of the return on that approval for your life. And so even just knowing that short list of people whose approval that you really would like to have and anybody else that comes along the way, it's fine. And, you know, there's going to be another story scandal, you know, narrative. It's, somebody else is going to be right. going through something in the near future that they're going to have a comment on and you're suddenly not going to be the target of their right. opinion. So just holding out that everything has a season and this is all just continuing to, you know, hone you into becoming a stronger person and giving you the freedom to make your own life choices. Yeah. I mean, I feel like this circles all back to the recovering perfectionist thing, because mm -hmm. as a perfectionist, you want everyone to like you. You don't want oh. anyone to say anything negative about you. It's yes. And uh, it's been a challenge. Let me tell you. I mean, I feel like my work right now is in creating and putting it out there and keeping my head down and going back and creating more and, and, and putting it out there. Uh, if I get too stuck in the feedback and comment section of, you know, social media, I lose it. Uh, right. And there's, there's so many people that say horrific things that have no idea my life or my background or the amount of community service work, but they've, they've chosen to judge me based upon mm -hmm. a single video that they've seen that they didn't like. And it's, it's interesting that this is what we do to each other. Um, and I, you know, I've chosen to put myself in the situation because I know in order for me to elevate to the next level, in order for me to become the person that I need to be to share the messages that I want to share, I have to have a thick skin about this and I have to be able to decipher between what is a real piece of feedback and what's just a blanket criticism from someone that's also hurting. And what I'm learning more and more as I, as I engage some of these haters is that these people are so hurt themselves and they're just trying to find something else to focus on that makes them feel better about themselves. And you either are creating or you're consuming. And if you're consuming, that leads to criticizing. So my goal is to always be creating because if I'm in a creative space, then that's where I have the divine energies flowing through me. That's where I feel like I'm actually serving other people. And, uh, and I, I just have to be very careful about how much I'm consuming. And I see that for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. what, what do you want to create? What do you want to put out in the world? The more we do that, the, the happier, more fulfilled we all are. Right. And so on your website, you have uh, uh, four steps to confidence workbook. Can you share one step today to wrap it up? 
Yes. So, uh, you know, I created this, this four steps to quit confidence workbook, because I feel like so often people are looking for external validation. We as perfectionists are constantly wanting approval. Um, and we give away so much of our power and how we feel about ourselves and, and creating that confidence and letting go of inadequacy. So I went through and decided what are some quick things that you have control over that will immediately spike your confidence and make you feel better about yourself. So they're all actionable items. You don't need anybody's approval. You don't need anything external except your own personal work to start working on this. Um, and one of my favorites ones is turning the focus away from yourself. So this, this act of self-focus, when we get so lost in our own narrative, you know, we're in a very narcissistic age. We take more selfies uh, and more photos of ourselves than any other generation. We know that statistically that's connected and making people feel more focused on themselves and their lives and the comments and how many likes they're getting and who's following them. Um, but when we spend time in that space, we, we are automatically setting ourselves up to feel more inadequate and to start comparing. So my biggest piece of advice there is to go out and serve somebody else, go do a community service project, volunteer, even just offer, you know, put up on Facebook, hey, I want to hear how, how you're doing. Does anybody need to have a phone call to talk about where they're at? And when you remove the focus from yourself and shift it to somebody else, that opens up so many channels for you to not only see your own value and, and what you can offer, but also just bringing in this positivity into the world. And it really takes you away from focusing on your negatives to how you can actually be of service to others. And that's where the magic is. And it's about connection, right? Because what you're Absolutely. saying is put your phone down, stop looking at the social media and connect with people and connect with, with external and in your, in yourself outside yes. of just a picture. If yeah. we want authentic confidence and connection, that involves real human connection. Right. <laughs> Funny enough. Shocking. <laughs> yeah. So you can go to my website, hillarybillings.com uh, to subscribe and get free access to my four steps to quick confidence work, but I've received a lot of positive feedback for it. I hope it helps your audience uh, and, and helps you because I, I just think it's so powerful to know what you can be doing right now to gain your confidence, especially during times of adversity, especially when you don't feel like it, especially in times where you feel like there is no hope and you don't know how to feel better about yourself. This is the time to do the work and start the work to get back to that neutral space. We're only going for neutral. That's what we're starting with and it's it's totally achievable and I believe in you that that's great advice and all of Hillary's contact information will be in the show notes as well so thank you Hillary so much for spending the the past half hour with us and uh, oh, you're so welcome such great advice thank you yay